So the question to ask is all the university laboratories, industry linkage, industry linkage is much more for the supply of human resource, which of course is a very important thing, rather than that for the generation of technologies by itself. And this is in fact a, a proposition that I would submit for you. Because we have spent far too much time discussing uh, about university industry linkage. There are very few countries in the world which have actually got this link between university. Because if universities and research institutes do research and production is done also. And there are very few countries in the world which have actually got this link correct. Of course, you can talk about specific good cases. For instance, I know that the ISCT here uh, has been the pharmaceutical industry. And in fact, Hyderabad is uh, famous for, uh, uh, for being the pharmaceutical capital of India, and, and, and so on. And, we didn't, uh, and, and, and for establishing the pharmaceutical industry, the Indian Institute of Chemical Technology has actually played a very important role. Okay. And so you have some specific for the National Chemical Laboratory or the Central Drug Research Institute, and so on. So you have some isolated cases here and there, but by and large, I think uh, the university industry language is not an issue as far as uh, India is concerned, because very little research is actually performed. Um, uh, I think in just a second, you can see that that proportion is also not showing any increase over, over the last several years. Now, so uh, so I'm making the point that for the industrial sector, you can actually look at uh, the various components. You have public sector enterprises, then you have government, government research institutes like. The, uh, the CSI laboratory, the corporate harmony of HDL or HMT and so on. And so you have to add that to the uh, amount of expenditure expended by the CSI laboratory because all the CSI laboratories by and large have a mandate to work on uh, uh, technologies which are related to industry by and large. Okay? Although it's, uh, uh, some individual laboratories, uh, they, they would like to be called a, a laboratory devoted to the study of modern biology rather than a biotechnology laboratory and so on. And, and uh, notwithstanding those uh, exceptions, by and large, the CSI laboratories are expected to work on technologies which are actually related to industry. If you look at the Abhi Dosen Review Committee, which was the last official review, uh, which was done, I think, in 1986, if I'm not mistaken, that is the last official review. And, uh, and, and uh, um, it has got some specific comments to talk in terms of uh, how much of your budget will have to come from the industry in terms of selling technology. But actually, uh, uh, my submission is that it should be added. But even if you were not, even if you are not adding this, the uh, CSIR to uh, to the government here, still, what you if within the industrial R&D, what you would find is that increasingly large amount of industrial R&D is actually performed and financed by the industry itself. In fact, about two thirds of the industrial R&D right now is actually performed and financed by the private sector. According to the RMT survey done by the uh, by the uh, DST, and as I said, that they had, um, and, and in our country there was always a kind of a cliche, almost like a cliche, that uh, the DST data cannot be believed because we have some tax incentive for research. So uh, companies tend to to take advantage of this tax incentive. They simply exaggerate their RMT expenditures because the, the, you know the tax incentives are linked to the size of the, of the RMT expenditures. If you do X dollars of R&D expenditures during a certain financial year, then 100% of, or maybe 125% of that X dollars can be deducted from your taxable income for that year. Okay, and, and uh, uh, so because of because of all these, uh, uh, there has been a tendency on the part of uh, companies to exaggerate. That is the kind of a, a general belief. So the TST data cannot be uh, should be taken with a pinch of salt. That's what people used to say. Okay. On the other hand, if you take the other data source, which is the CMI data source, which is again uh, from annual report information, and uh, notwithstanding the recent cases of uh, uh, you know accounting frauds and so on, but by and large, I think uh, most of the uh, most of the uh, you know the, the information which are in annual reports can be believed because this information is actually certified by qualified chartered, chartered accountants. And since after an amendment of the Indian Companies Act of 1989, uh, companies have to uh, uh, to report information on R&D and other technology-related activities as part of the director's report. Okay. And so, uh, when you compare the DST and the CMI data, both are, as I said, increasingly are coinciding. So the DST data are not an exaggeration. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that uh, this is a fairly true picture of what is happening 
and right now, but increasingly a large amount of our interest in R&D is actually performed and financed by the private sector enterprises. Nearly two thirds of that is done by the Now, which are these private, which are these industrial sectors? Okay. Again, uh, if we can go to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this gives you a cumulative picture from 1998, 1999 to 2002, 2003. And what you find is that approximately 90 to 20 percent of the interest guarantee expenditures are actually expended by the pharmaceutical industry. Okay. So just one particular industry itself is accounting for about 20 percent, followed by what is called transportation, which is basically the automotive industry. And as you know, uh, I would suspect that uh, most of this what is claimed as automotive is basically auto parts industries, auto parts firms, because as you know, the Indian auto parts sector has become highly competitive in the last several years. So, and then you can also find that information technology industry has also become uh, about approximately 5% of the total R&D expenditures, then defense of course, and chemicals, and, and then you have electric, electrical and electronic equipments. So these are the major sectors where R&D is actually performed. So one particular industry which is extremely important is the pharmaceutical industry and please keep that the back, of, back of your mind because again more and more <coughs> indicators of innovation will point to the pharmaceutical industry. So summarizing the input indicators, although overall current expenditures have actually gone down, basically what you find is that there's been a shift that occurred from government to the private sector. Okay? And uh, government to the industrial sector, and, with, and, and industrial R&D expenditures have actually increased quite tremendously during this period of uh, liberalisation. So industrial R&D expenditures have actually increased, and within the industrial sector, much of the R&D is actually expended and performed by the private sector enterprises and private sector enterprises in the pharmaceutical sector. Okay, again, Hyderabad is very important because some of the pharmaceutical firms are actually located here. Dr. Reddy's laboratories. And so on, and, and, and so on uh, are actually located here. And now I go to the output based indicators, which are basically weightings. Now you have a number of uh, the variety of weighting indicators which can be used. These are uh, Indian weightings uh, taken by Indians in the US, uh, which is a very good quality indicator because it's almost like having a foreign publication. Because in, in, in academic discourse, if we have a foreign publication, that is in a, in a referee journal, that is considered to be much better than having 200 publications in a journal in India. Okay? And uh, so similarly, uh, having a US patent is very important because US is the major market for disembodied technologies in the world. So if you want to signal yourself to the rest of the world about your capability, you will have to take a patent in the US. And, and please mind that taking a patent in the US is extremely difficult because it costs a lot of money, both in terms of uh, issue uh, for getting the patent issue and also for maintain, maintaining that. So companies and institutions will self-select and uh, patent only the best technologies abroad. So that uh, so because of that process of self-selection, very you know US patents are also a very good indicator of the quality of these uh, uh, patents. The second kind of indicator that one can use is basically patents secured by Indians in India itself in the Indian patent office. Okay. So we will use those indicators as well to see what is the kind of uh, trends which are emerging. The third indicator that I would use is what is called triadic patent. This is the latest thing. That triadic patents are patents taken from the same family of patents, same technology class, in three different uh, patent offices, the US PTO, the European Patent Office, and the Japanese uh, Patent Office. Okay. Now, it costs an enormous amount of money to take out patents in all these three so again, the self-selection would be even tighter, even stricter there uh, by firms. So by looking at the number of uh, uh, trial patents, again, you can form some opinions about the quality of uh, you know, patents which are actually taken. The fourth indicator of patents that I would use is what is called patents uh, applied for and granted uh, by in, uh, in the Patents Corporation Treaty. This Patents Corporation Treaty is part of the World Intellectual Property Organization, which is a UN organization. So if you have a patent applied for in the Patent Corporation Treaty, it is almost equivalent to having a patent applied for in all the countries in the world, which are members of the UN. Okay? And so India became a member of the Patent Corporation Treaty only in 1999. So you have the data since 2000 for, uh, for data uh, on the PCT application. Then I use what is called bibliometric data, which is publications data, publications by Indian scientists, which is much more for basic research. And then I use some export-based measures, with, uh, looking at 
the technology content of ETS exports, whether that has actually increased during this period, and what is happened, and, and, and whether there has been a diversification of ETS exports to more technology intensive products and services. We have already seen that the overall domestic product itself, there has been a shift from, uh, you know, although the shift is uh, only about 14%, but at least it's a shift, shift from 0 to 14%, okay, yeah, as far as the domestic output is concerned. Now, whether you can see a similar shift as far as exports are concerned, that's the I'm going to look at. And lastly, I will look at what is called the technology balance of payments, because this is also extremely important. Just like our balance of payments for commodities, we can also measure the technology balance of payments. And uh, you know, we can actually measure it. Thanks to the Reserve Bank of India's data again, uh, we can measure it up to 2007. And, and because of the growing RIP outsourcing, uh, which is taking place in India, and of which again, Hyderabad is an important